Thank you all for tuning in. Today's episode is going to be the last of the pre-recorded videos that we did in 2020. So as I've mentioned in previous podcasts, that will hopefully be the end of kind of the inconsistent and honestly not so great audio as well as video for the uh, the video on YouTube version of the podcast. But with that being said, if you are really into biology odd species and into genetics and the science behind genetics specifically with like ball pythons because that's what everybody's into um but not just ball pythons then this will be the episode for you so hope you enjoy that uh with that being said if we can call this a sponsor but keep calm it's just a snake podcast is brought to you by jay-z's reptile store and merchandise so just as a quick little update we do still have quite a variety of colors and sizes of both women's and unisex t-shirts and our two different designs the standard jay-z's reptiles logo as well as the amazing uh snake inspirational quote one um we also have some stickers and we still have quite a few other things as well as i'm doing um zoom or you know via online social distancing reptile shows if anyone's interested um they can email jay-z's reptiles at gmail.com or message us on instagram or facebook or anything like that um with that in mind so we do 10 percent of all t-shirt sales donated to a specific cause a couple times a year we've done us arc in the past excuse me um and that went pretty well considering no one really knows that we exist um, for the first part of this year, we donated 20% of t-shirt sales to the Denver Zoo. As we all know, COVID was and still is, you know, really hard for a lot of people in places, and especially places like the Denver Zoo, where the animals still need to be fed, lights still need to be turned on, everything, people still need to be paid for taking care of the animals. So a lot of the revenue that comes in to help pay for that was lost. And so they were going through a little really hard financial time. So we did 20% donated to the Denver Zoo. It wasn't as much as I would have liked, but you know, that's the way the cookie crumbles or however the saying goes. But so for now that it's April, so for the next three months, it will be donated to Friends of Scales Rescue. They're an amazing rescue headed up by some great people and an amazing board with like everything that you think of with Reptile Rescue, they do right. And so that's why I want to donate 10% of all t-shirt sales to friends of scales rescue so from now through for the next three months 10 percent will be donated of t-shirt sales because in all honesty 10 percent of two dollars on a sticker isn't going to be a whole lot but hey technically everybody counts but for all t-shirt sales will be donated to friends of scales rescue and just in case any of you are wondering and you don't live where they are they do ship so if any of you are interested go find them um i'll put the link at the bottom of this of this podcast as well as um i'll put it up on quite a few different videos that we do if you want to go hit them up go through the application process check them out and if you're interested in adopting a reptile then hey i would highly recommend them so with that in mind thank you so much and hope you enjoy the episode hey everyone thanks for coming to the keep calm it's just snake podcast today we have an amazing guest he's a microbiologist uh, i actually asked him for a little bit of help with a video we did uh, back in the spring about genetics. Uh, this is Travis Wyman. And Travis, uh, tell us a little about, about yourself. Um, well, I I guess going all the way back, I caught my first snake when I was five on the playground at preschool, and it's kind of been just downhill ever since then. Um, yep. <laughs> you know, one snake became two snakes, became 10 snakes, became, I think, one summer... I actually caught like 50 odd garter snakes oh in and around, in and around town. My, my, my mother was not pleased. No, I imagine uh, not. Yeah. I, I was, I was keeping them in, you know, glass tanks, styrofoam coolers, shoe boxes. I'm sure there were so many escapees that it's kind of ridiculous, but that's awesome. Um, you know, finally started really focusing and getting, my head on straight with, you know, keeping things about junior high-ish. Um, I bought my first 
albino corn snake back then from a little pet shop. Um, actually, so I'm originally from Colorado. So down off of, uh, down off of uh, Colorado and Colfax area, there used to be a reptile and fish store called Tropic Seas, which unfortunately isn't there anymore. But it's where I got my, uh, my first corn snake, um, paid $150 for it, which, you know, it was a lot back then for an albino cord snake, and he made it to twenty-seven that's, years old. So I mean, that he went everywhere. Cool. You know, he made it through junior high, through high school, through college. Where my brother took care of him in college, he actually got out for six months, disappeared in the house, yeah. was found on the back of the toilet, didn't even phase him. Um, <laughs> Moved from Colorado to Georgia, from Georgia to Maryland, and yeah. were you able to? Take, was is that why you had to have your brother take care of him when you were in Georgia? No, I had to have him take care of him when I was in Colorado. I was a uh, in college at uh, Colorado State, oh. and they just wouldn't let me have the snake there. Yeah, I didn't realize that they were illegal in Georgia <laughs> until about a week before I moved away from Georgia. So, <laughs> hey, no harm, no foul. Come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I. I understand the laws for not keeping native species to a point, um, but when something is obviously captive bred and not a wild animal, right? I think the laws maybe go a little bit too far. And an albino cord snake that I purchased in Colorado and moved from Colorado with is, you know, it's pretty legitimately not a wild animal that I pulled out of the woods in Georgia, right? You know, and, I've heard the argument of, well, but sometimes you find albinos in the wild. And yeah, sure, that's true. But what are the statistical odds that I'm going to find one in the wild in the middle of Georgia? Not several, not many, down. especially around Atlanta. So, right. yeah, isn't, it, isn't it New Jersey that it has the law where it's like you can't have a corn snake unless it has red eyes? Because Yeah, I, I think it is New Jersey. And, you know, like things like that make sense because they recognize – there are the wild type ones, which they can't necessarily regulate, but then there are the morphs that are bred for captive purposes. Yep. And so those should be allowed to be kept. And, you know, common sense laws like that, you know, yeah, those, those speak to me. I'm not saying that we should be completely lawless because I think some of the laws and regulations that are in place are probably prudent, yeah. but I think a lot of times they go too far. That is definitely true. It's definitely an overreaching kind of thing. But um, um, you know, in Georgia see. is when I finally got around to hitting. Well, I can't say that. I hit a reptile show in Colorado, which was the sketchiest thing I had ever seen. It was like it, it in somebody's hotel room, and like oh you just gosh. walked around the hotel room, and it had like nine people in there. Um, so my first real reptile show was in Georgia. Um, you know, and I picked up just a wild type ball there because it was a species that I always wanted to have. Um, picked up a few other weird things, had some buddies. Um, one of my other hobbies is carnivorous plants. I got to know the guys over at Atlanta Botanical really well. One of the guys there, he um, also did some work over at Zoo Atlanta and he was really into reptiles and stuff. Got to know him. I picked up a chondro from him. Uh, she's a 2003 animal. She's still kicking around upstairs. So, you know, it's a fairly decent condor. You're not going to find many 17 year old condors out there. No, uh, that's true. Was she just kind of like a, a mutt condor? I don't really know what she is. No, she's, she is a pure Aru from oh. the Denver Zoo clutch of Ooh. 2003. Um, and I have the paperwork and everything going back to her. She, the entire clutch went to Rico Walder. My buddy picked up her and two of her siblings from Rico and you know he he really liked the two two of the three that he got and one of them it was still a nice animal it just wasn't what exactly he was looking for so I took her off of his hands nice yeah Rico, um, it's, it seems like Rico's name comes up a lot kind of just all over the place yeah Rico I mean <laughs> I never had the pleasure to actually talk to him but he had a very large impact on the hobby. Um, you know, his keeping of green tree pythons and emerald tree boas and stuff, he was able to do a lot of things to, I don't want to say demystify them, but 
at least bring them back from this level where they were these really crazy difficult, really hard to breed, really hard to keep species, and made people understand that, no, you, one, you can keep these, and two, you're part, part of the reason we're having so much trouble with them is because we're keeping them wrong. Right. Yeah, um, almost like chameleons. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they want more open ventilation. They don't want to be 100% humidity all the time, 100 degrees all the time. Um, so his his footprint is is very well established there and you know it sucks that he passed yeah. so young and you know he he probably could have done a lot more for the hobby if he had been able to you know maintain but this is one of the things about cancer it's a fucking bitch <laughs> pardon me <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> yeah but uh, well, we'll we'll move on from that because it's a little a little sobering, unfortunately. Yes. But so, really, um, number one, you're. I'm I'm really glad I actually uh, got to hold you from listening from the from the ground up from Joe's podcast. Um, but I always have a lot of people ask me to try to explain genetics, you specifically with ball pythons. So, like from the top. We get into it. So there's the base wild phenotype, which means, you know, the pattern that it's expressing that, you know, the incomplete dominant and recessive trait. So everyone in the trade is still kind of calling them codom. So what's the difference actually between a codominant expressive phenotype and an incomplete dominant? Okay. Um, so inheritance, there are basically two ways you inherit things. Mm -hmm. recessive and dominant and with recessive it means you need to have both copies of the gene to be able to see the impact of the mutation of that gene yes. so it's recessive because it's hidden by the wild type one now with a dominant trait if there is a mutation to the gene you only need one copy of that mutant gene to see a change in phenotype from the wild type Okay, then under dominant inheritance, you have two expression types. You have simple dominant, which if you have one copy of the mutant gene or two copies of the mutant gene, the phenotype is the same. So it's, it's a simple change that you can see either fully, well, you see it fully because just one copy of the gene causes that. Um, with incomplete dominant, one copy of the gene induces a change away from wild type, but two copies of the gene induces another step forward of the gene. So you can think of it as the full expression of the mutation is incomplete when you only have one copy, but when you have two, then you get the whole expression type. Right. So to make, to make it a little bit more graspable, we could say that if an animal inherits one copy of that mutant gene, specifically the Mojave gene, if it re receives one copy, then it expresses that that initial change from the wild type to that Mojave trait. If it receives right. two copies, then it becomes that blue-eyed, total white, leucistic ball python. Although with yeah, that, it does, so uh, that's that's your three phenotypes: the wild type, where you have no mutation copy, mm -hmm. the Mojave, which is one mutation, and then the all white snake, which is the two mutations, you know, both copies of the gene are mutated. So it's, it's sort of a stepwise progression. You have one change and then you have a second full change. And is that why um, they're able to kind of, the different genes are able to stack visually because of that? Within, I, like within the allelic complex? Um, no, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the alleles in just a second. So, okay. you know, for, you know, a uh, lesser pastel clown ball python. So right there, that's expressing several Three different, different genes. genes. Yeah. And and that's because those genes are unrelated to one another. So, you know, the, the genes that I have that give me green eyes are completely different from the genes that I have that give me brown hair. Right. You know, so you have, when you have multiple different genes, you know, you get all these different combinations and that's why, you know, it's why everybody looks different than each other. It's why your snakes all look different than each other. Even if you have all wild types, 
they're all going to be different because like, you know, some pattern is expressed more, some pattern is expressed less, some are a little bit more brown, some are a little bit more gold, some have got a reddish tone, some have got a blacker tone, you know, you've got, when you look at a snake, it's really easy to point to a snake that's a mutant to be like, well, that's a lesser. Right. Okay. But aside from that one gene that you can really recognize like that, you've got another 30,000 genes in there. Right. And I think a lot and of people forget that. All of, all of those genes can have different, you know, different forms, different flavors, different mutations to them, different expression patterns that can change things, which is why, you know, the hobby of ball pythons has gone a little bit crazy with the whole dinker idea because somebody picks up something as a lesser and it's just a normal lesser. It was, it was a lesser bred to a wild type or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're convinced that it's, it's actually something really special because, you know, it, it's just one fraction of a degree off from the picture of the lesser that they found on Google. Well, the reason it's one fraction of a degree different than the one you found on Google is because one of those oh. is different. So, yeah, that's, I think that's something that a lot of people, you know, tend to forget or it, you know, like you kind of said, you, we fall into the trap of the, mo of the ball Python craze where it's, you know, unless it fits this exact thing, then it may not be that, you know, for yeah. like, for instance, the calico gene though, you know, that's, I think that's, that's just a regular dominant trait. We believe it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have not seen anything that would indicate that it isn't, but at the same time, I haven't seen anything that would indicate that there is a homozygous calico out there. Now it could just be because nobody's, you know, when you breed calico to calico and you don't get a super calico, everybody just gave up because what's the point, you know? And like, I think we saw that with pinstripe. I think we've seen that with leopard, um, you know, the ball python hobby again it's so geared towards phenotypes that if you don't get that super different phenotype then nobody continues to bother with it yep and i think that's that that's the thing it's where it's it's more it's more sir genes like that that can be so variable even with line breeding yes. that they just kind of write it off where you can have an almost a non-expressive you know visual design of that of that gene and it still has those genes but as you said there's a whole lot of other things that dictate what it's going to end up looking like yeah and and genes aren't exactly like a light switch yeah where it's it's an on off type of thing some genes are but most genes are kind of they're kind of like a dimmer switch you know they're on but depending on how they get stimulated, they're either on really hard or really soft or somewhere in between. And how the genes in one animal are expressed are going to be completely different from another animal because, you know, if gene A regulates gene B, regulates gene C, okay, well, if both of those animals, if their gene A expression is identical, but their gene B expression is different, then obviously their gene C expression is also going to be different. So at the end of the day, they're going to they're going to diverge from each other exactly. in what they look like because, but they're still the same animal. It's not because there's a mutation to those genes. It's just how they get expressed a little bit differently. You know, yep. everybody, you know, everybody on the road sets their car to 70 miles an hour with cruise control. But you'll notice that over time, some of the cars pull a little bit further ahead. Some of them fall a little bit further behind because even though they all say you're going 70 miles an hour, each car's gears are changing a little bit differently, torquing a little bit differently. So you start to see a difference in where those cars are, even though nominally we're all driving at 70. Right. And now we're getting into crossing over into nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and nobody likes to think about that. <laughs> no, they don't. Oh, well, I'm, I mean, you could, they talk about in Jurassic Park. Everybody likes that. Um, but <laughs> so... So from that, when we talk a little bit about, you know, the, the expressing of these different genes, and we brought it up a little bit before with, so for the allelic animals and what, it, can you, cause I always do a very poor job of explaining this mostly because I will fumble tripping over the exact phrasing of it. So could you, you know, for everybody out there kind of give a 
not necessarily blanket statement because I don't really like blanket statements, but you know, a good representation of what exactly an allele it, what an allele is, and then how an analytic animal is expressed uh, phenotypically. Yes. I can do that, but I'm going to rewind because I realized I didn't fully finish your question of what's the difference between incomplete dominant and codominant. That is a good. Point. I defined incomplete dominant for you, but then we just kind of dropped codominant off. Yeah, we you know, did by the side of the road. Um, so, getting with codominant. Um, codominance is not inheritance, so you don't inherit something in a codominant way. Codominance describes a relationship between alleles. And so this, this goes nicely to the question of what are alleles. All right. um, so if something is codominant, like I said, it describes a relationship. And the way I like to say this to make it a bit more understandable is to relate it to, you know, families and stuff. Okay. I'm a parent. I have kids. Right. My wife is a parent. She has kids. Together and I, my wife co-parent, our children, okay? Um, do you have kids? I do not. Okay, well, then we'll, we'll, we'll set you to the side. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I, one of our children is my daughter from a previous marriage, okay? So my wife and I co-parent her because she's, she lives with us. And I co-parent with my ex-wife, you know, to an extent, because we have this same child together. Mm -hmm. My other daughter, my, my wife now, she was also previously married. That daughter comes from her marriage. Okay, so we've established that I am a co-parent with both of these girls. Mm -hmm. And we have established that my now wife is a co-parent with both of these girls. And that I also co-parent with my ex-wife. But my ex-wife and my current wife are not co-parents of our youngest daughter because there is no relationship between my ex-wife and my current wife. Yes. So while both my ex and my current are co-parents, they're only co-parents when it comes to my eldest daughter because, you know, she lives with me, but she also has to goes and visits her mother you know so i co-parent with my ex whenever anything comes up that has to be dealt with with our oldest but i also co-parent with my current wife when my eldest daughter is in the house and we're having to parent in the now yes i co-parent with my current wife with our youngest because she lives with us but my ex-wife and my current wife never have anything to do with each other when it comes to our youngest daughter mm -hmm. so that co describes the relationship, but it only goes so far. Just because my ex and current are co-parents doesn't mean that they're co-parents to each other. Right. You know, expanding it out, you know, my neighbor next door, their parents, they co-parent their children. But just because they co-parent and my wife and I co-parent, I don't co-parent their children. So if I go hang out with John next door, yep. John and I are not co-parents <laughs> because, you know, we're just parents. Yes. John is a parent. I am a parent. But John and I have no relationship when it comes to his kids or my kids. So we're just parents at that point. So that's where the co-dominant thing kind of falls apart. And I blame the school system for this because they, <laughs> they picked a really bad example to stick in school books um, of the white and pink flower. There it is. <laughs> yep. I was going to say. <laughs> And the reason it's a really bad example is because it never specifically clarifies the fact that there's a third type of flower color yep. <laughs> to that flower right. that just gets left out. Yep. You know, they only they only talk about the specific mutations. Um, the blood the blood types in humans are a much better example of that. Yes, um, you know, you've got the three blood types: O, A, and B. O is recessive. A and B are dominant. Yep. You know, if you have genotype A, A you have O blood or A blood. If you have A O, you have A blood. Yep. Same for B, B B or B O. You have B. And if you have A and B, that's when you have codominance because A and B are both expressed at the same time. But 
you're not inheriting B in a co-dominant fashion. You're still inheriting B in a dominant fashion. You yeah. just have two different dominant genes, and that's why it's co-dominant. Yes, exactly. So now playing that back to alleles, what's a really easy way to think of alleles? Um, <laughs> think of them like a deck of cards, okay? If I have, I see where you're going. If I have the ace of spades, the gene is the ace. Yes. Okay. And the allele is the suit. So it's a spade. Okay. So that's the wild type. The ace of spades is the wild type. And then the wild type, you normally have two ace of spades. One yep. that you get from mom, one that you get from dad. Two different decks of cards. Okay. Now, an allele is just a different suit to the gene. So now I inherit the ace of spades from dad, but I inherit the ace of hearts from mom. Yep. Okay. That ace of hearts is a different allele. And then you also have the ace of clubs and the ace of diamonds. So in a card deck, you would have four alleles of the ace. Now, obviously, with you know things like ball pythons, you got a lot more suits than just the full spade, heart, club, and diamond. Yep. You know, you've got pound sign, ampersand, carrot, percentage, dollar sign, whatever, you know, for the wild type, the Mojave, the Russo, the special, the butter, the bamboo the mystic the phantom you know you can just keep tack st tacking them up but ultimately the easiest way to think about them is like different suits in a card deck exactly so that's and that's and that's how when you have you still will, you'll get a pair they're still aces right you get a pair and they're still aces but they they don't match each other in terms of suit correct but when you put them together you still get a pair and that's how you get that Mystic Potion, Blue Eyed Leucistic, um, Purple Passion, whatever ones are out there these days. Crystal. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Crystal. The Karma. Yeah. Just depending on how you pair them up. Yeah, exactly. So, realistically, that's kind of the most confusion that I see with that is just the 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 incorrect um, idea that of the codom versus incomplete dominant, and then. Most people seem to get their head around recessive pretty easily, although I think they start to lose people with like the allelic recessives. Um, yeah, and those get a little bit confusing, but I mean, it's really the same thing. Yes. It's just, I think where people get lost is when they breed out an allelic recessive. Yeah. And they've got those het animals and they don't know what to call them. Yep. And um, so I work with the Candinos. Mm -hmm. and albinos a lot and i have just taken to calling my animals het candino okay. and whenever i sell a het candino animal animal i make sure to explain to the person who's buying it you know what exactly that means it means this animal is absolutely a het i just can't tell you if it's het albino or het candy it's one of them absolutely but I don't know which because I haven't bred it yet because I just hatched the thing out of an egg. Yep. Um, and most of the time, mm -hmm. people seem to understand that. Yes. But every once in a while, I get people you know who argue with me like, no, that animal can't be a double het candino genetic stripe. It has to be a triple het. I'm like, no, it's not a triple het because it's only got two genes. Yes, exactly. It's got genetic stripe and it's got either candy or albino. I just don't know which one. I'm not going to sell it as a triple hit because that makes people think that they're getting three genes in there. Yes, exactly. Um, um, you know, I'm starting to see it now with the the cryptic and the clown to make the krypton. Oh, yeah. Um, people are selling as either het clown or het cryptic. And that works too. I mean, technically, yes. Because it is either het clown or het cryptic. You just don't know which. Um, I don't work with clown or cryptic, but since I already use het candino, my default would be to call them het kryptons because everybody knows the krypton is the hetero allelic expression form. So yep, exactly. You know, but again, if I if I worked with it and I bred a krypton out and sold it as a het krypton. I would be making sure that the buyer understood what het krypton meant and not just assume that they know. I would explain 
what it is because you know it's easier for me to just write het one thing rather than het a or het b you know we all got to find minutes in the day <laughs> it's, it does get a little yeah i mean it's i haven't been paying too much attention to the ball python market as much as i probably should because i really only work with like Pides, bells, and then a couple other miscellaneous um, codon. I, like I see, even I do it. Uh, a couple other incomplete dominant. So yeah, it's it's so ingrained in the hobby it that is. people just fall into it. And yeah, you know, I I don't I I'm, I only mind it really when it's explained how the mistake is made, mm -hmm. and you know. When people say it mistakenly because they don't know, that's fine. Yep. It's when they insist on continuing to say it, yeah. when they know that it's wrong, and they can even admit that it's wrong, that's when I start to get bothered. You know, Well, yeah, no, it's just a hobby term, so we can use it. No, it's not a hobby term. It's yep. a legitimate scientific term. Yep. <laughs> and you know that it's wrong, and you know what the right one is, so why not use the right one? I know, but that's what we've always used. Well, but just because it's what we've always used doesn't mean that we can't correct ourselves when we're wrong. Yeah, that's a that's a slippery slope that bleeds into a lot of other stuff. It is, you know, it's you know, it's a dangerous argument because it can be applied very poorly in other situations, yeah. and it can be applied against us. And those are the type of things that I don't like to see. Exactly. Um, so now I know you don't do too much work with boas. Um, but I mean, it uh, depends on the type of boa. <laughs> yeah. I have I have a pair of rubber boas, but well, I have a trio of rubber boas. But right now they're sitting, you know, in a store an uninsulated storage closet where it's you know currently sitting at about forty degrees. Oh, and I have I'm a Doomerol's boa sitting in a cage, but she just likes to just sit in the cage. But that's all I do. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna circle back to the rubber boas because I actually don't know too many people that um, that actually keep rubber boas. But um, so, you know, there's a few different uh, albino boa constrictors or BIs out there right now. Um, Sharp and call. Oh, there's there's even more than that now. Oh, friend. OK. Well, I, I know Sharp and I know call. Yeah. <laughs> they have been seen that they are incompatible. And it's probably because Sharp is not a true um, T negative albino because it's one of them isn't a true T negative. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the Sharp we is don't have the genetic negative. level to know which one. And yeah. I know one of them is allelic to the bow woman caramel to make the paradigm. Yep. I, I don't remember which one it is. I just know that one of them is. My guess would be that whichever one that is, is not a true T negative, and it's the other one that is a true T negative. But again, that's just a guess. It's not an absolute certainty. Yep. And that's, um, yeah, that's the, that's the sharp that's allelic with the, with the bow woman caramel and then the call. Okay. Is, is that and so that's what um, they've basically come to the conclusion that that's what it is is that it's not necessarily a true T negative that it probably does have some tyrosinase in there which um, actually you know what since we got here let's just talk about uh, let's talk a little bit about albinism and what you know there's because there's different genes that you know add color to things like there's anerthophores and azanthophores and tyrosinase and all these different proteins that make up like the color of the snake. Mm -hmm. So when you have a, a VP, uh, a, a T positive boa or T positive animal. So what that means is that it's an albino recessive trait and correct me if I'm, if I misstep at all that has tyrosinase in protein in that gene that mm -hmm. shows the expressive phenotype of that animal, correct? Yes. So okay. yeah, with albinos, we've got the two types, yes. tyrosinase negative and tyrosinase positive. Mm -hmm. And there is only one type of tyrosinase negative, but there are, there's m potentially many types of tyrosinase positive because how you build melanin is a multi-step pathway. Um, depending on the organism, it's anywhere from like seven to 15 different steps. Right. And each of those steps have different components that feed into them. And 
branched off of them. So you can break anywhere along that chain of steps and induce a state that is lacking some or all melanin. Right. But the very first step is absolutely dependent on tyrosinase. Mm -hmm. And so if you break the tyrosinase, then basically the whole pathway just falls apart. Right. Um, so those are tyrosinase negative, T negatives. Um, if you break something in the second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever, whatever step, yep. you still have that tyrosinase that can push the very first step. It's just after that, things fall apart. So anything after the first step is considered tyrosinase positive. Um, there are also mutations that have nothing to do with the synthesis of melanin, mm -hmm. but have to do with, you know, the cells that carry the melanin or the cells that carry the cells that carry the melanin or the cells that anchor the cells that hold the melanin. So, you know, if, if you make melanin fine, but the cells that hold it right. can't hold it, you know, if, you know, if you think of a cell like a water balloon, mm -hmm. well, if instead of a water balloon, you've got two spaghetti colanders stuck together and all the melanin just bleeds out, right. you're going to look like an albino because you don't have any melanin in your cells anymore. Right. But you still have the tyrosinase there because obviously you made the melanin and it went into the cell just fine. It just didn't stay there because it bled out through all the holes. Right. And that's completely unrelated to how you make the melanin. That's just how the melanin gets packaged and stored. And that's how you get the the varying between so i i have more people to, that follow me that do more boas versus ball pythons so that's why i keep throwing it back in mm -hmm. and that's how you get like a sharp which probably has tyrosinase somewhere in there yes uh, leading up to a vpi that also has it in there but somewhere along the way it has a little bit more melanin in there and then to a ca positive which are usually even a little bit more dark than the VPIs. It's like you can't really explain. And if we use if we use that that water balloon analogy again, okay? Yes. yes. So instead of a water balloon, the cell that holds the melanin, like I said, think of a spaghetti colander. Yes. Well, spaghetti colanders have holes. Okay. Now imagine if you could change the size of the holes. Exactly. If a melanin molecule inside of that cell that's got the holes in it, if the melanin molecule is the size of a garden pea. Yes. But your holes are the size of golf balls. Basically all of those peas are the, whole, the golf ball sized holes. Yep. So you're gonna have no melanin present left, present in those cells, because it all just bleeds away. Now imagine if those holes are just exactly the size of a pea, maybe a teeny bit larger, but not terribly much larger. Yes. Okay. Then those melanin molecules will bleed out, but they won't bleed out as fast. And they have to, they have to hit that hole just perfect to get out. If they hit it just a little bit off, then they bounce around and they stay inside of the cell. Mm -hmm. So some of the melanin, distributes out, but not all of it. Some of it's still contained in there. So because some of the melanin is still contained in there, your animal still has melanin pigment. Now it, it doesn't have as much as the wild type does, but it still has some of it, which is why you get that caramel look because some of the melanin has gone, but not all of it versus, right. you know, again, that one with the golf ball sized holes, P just flies right out of there. Now you don't have any melanin left. So you look like a T negative albino just because the melanin isn't held in place, even though you do make the melanin just fine. Yeah. So, um, which kind of leads a little bit to the animals that are melanistic, which have an overabundance of melanin production versus the normal wild types. So, for yes. instance, the IMG bow is the increasing melanin gene. So they're born looking kind of almost like a normal wild type, maybe a little with a few more freckles, but as they grow both, both between shedding and just growing in general, they become, 
they they get darker and darker and become more black as they go along is that kind of similar can we use that analogy as well to say that it's, it's that's different. i mean yes and no so that's a mutation again that is you know, again I, i'm not a boa person right. plus while melanism has been studied in some animals melanism is very poorly understood in reptiles mostly because Almost everything is very poorly understood in reptiles. Nobody really works with reptiles. You know, we've got we've got axolotls, and that's about the closest thing we have. And there are melanistic axolotls. Yep. I'm going to be honest. I have not read any papers on them, but I know that there are papers out there. You know, I could probably read up on them fairly quick and find out whether or not I'm wrong in my guess here. But you know, I own that this is just a guess, but it's a guess based on some things that I know that can happen with phenotypes that cause melanism. Now, the melanistic axolotls, they're born melanistic. So right. it's going to be different than what we see in IMG type bones, mm -hmm. which develop their, their melanism over time. Um, melanin, like, you know, most everything inside of a cell is a type of protein. Yes. And proteins are, uh, it's kind of like, you know, with all of your product placement and everything, it's, mm -hmm. it's got programmed obsolescence into it. Yes. Every protein has a lifespan and it's supposed to be turned over and chewed up within that, you know, once they come to the end of that time. Um, part of that is because it's not functioning the way it normally does or it's, its function is met and it needs to then be degraded and taken away to stop the process or something. Um, Melanin, you know, in the case of an IMG type boa, again, pure supposition, but just to get the idea, if right. if you think of that that programmed obsolescence as being a tag, mm -hmm. well, if I take that tag off, <laughs> now the melanin doesn't have an expiration date on it, basically. Yes. So that old melanin just sits around. But okay. new melanin is continually being produced. Okay. So then it's getting you know, you're just packaging more and more and more and more and more melanin in to something versus in a normal boa, as the old melanin hits its lifespan, mm -hmm. it gets broken up and degraded, but it gets replaced with new melanin so that boa tends to keep that same base level of melanin in it that keeps it at that normal, just brownish tan color. Right. Makes sense. Versus if you keep just cranking the melanin in, and none of the old stuff degrades. Mm -hmm. It's it's like if you take a, a brown colored pencil and you go over a piece of paper. Right. And then you go back to the top and you start drawing again with the brown pencil. And then you just keep laying down more and more layers of that brown colored pencil on top of it. Eventually, it's not going to look brown anymore. It's going to look really dark because you just keep laying down, laying down, laying down on top of it. Makes sense. I, that. That makes a lot of sense. And that sounds like that would be probably the closest to what is actually going on to make that, you know, animal just get darker and darker. I mean, again, like I said, it's a supposition. Yes. Um, it's a reasonable supposition. It's an educated guess. Mm -hmm. It's still a guess. You know, if somebody goes out there and is like, no, Travis said this is absolutely what's happening. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, no, Travis absolutely did not tell you that's what's happening. Travis just said, this is a way that something like this could happen. Right. And this is an explanation that, you know, most of us who are not geneticists can kind of understand, you know. Exactly. You know, I, I could get into whole kinds of epistatic behaviors and things like that, but nobody wants to hear that stuff because you've got to be sick in the head and follow a career path like mine where that kind of stuff is fun and entertaining. And let's be honest, 99.9% .9 of people out there don't find that kind of stuff entertaining. <laughs> we do to a, we do up until a point and it's yeah, up to a point. Like I said, I get down in right the, the, the deep nitty gritty points. Yeah. Most people don't. And I get that. So I just want to give the answers that at least get people to understand that there are ways that it can happen. This is one way that it could happen. I'm not saying absolutely this is the way. Correct. It just gives you a way to think about it. Which I think you know, needs it, to probably be a way that a lot of people need to start thinking right. about 
things. If, if you just want to stop with, it's kind of like the colored pencil, you know, if that's where your brain begins and ends with somebody who used a colored pencil on a piece of paper and then they went back and did it again and did it again versus somebody who goes in, does colored pencil, and then comes back and erases and does colored pencil. If that's all you need to hear to understand it, great. I'm yeah. happy. I love that. You know, I, I, I try to work with analogies where I can because the analogies, I think, sometimes make a lot more sense to people than just the nitty gritty nuts and bolts stuff, which can be confusing as I'll get it. I think it's in, in kind of like a here, we'll, we'll say here's like a good parallel. If you're an engineer and your designs are perfect, your testing is perfect, but because it goes into the hands of a person, they'll mess it up. So there's always yeah. some room for error, some margin of speculation. So you can take the basis of what you know and give the best you can, but not an absolute. Right. You know, the, the easier you make it for, you know, the easier the engineer makes it for the person who's getting the product yes. is the better it's going to be because then they don't have to worry that they're sending somebody something that's so complicated that it's just going to get messed up. I mean, exactly. It's, it's the IKEA instruction manual model. There you go. If, <laughs> if I can give you the IKEA instruction manual and have no words and just pictures and you can look at it and understand and put together your IKEA bookshelf, mm -hmm. that's great. Exactly. Could I tell you how to build that exact same bookshelf using, you know, words about torque and torsion and pressure and incidence angles and all of that? I could. You're not going to care. You just want the bookshelf built. And honestly, the easier it is for you to build the bookshelf, the happier you're going to be. Yep, exactly. So that being said, um, thank you for the uh, for kind of the breakdown on hobby science genetics and maybe like i really like that colored pencil analogy that's better than i've ever seen um or not seen I, that's a better way to put it than i've ever been able to come across so that being said you said you're working with rubber boas what other fun stuff are you messing with like that's <laughs> oddball kind of eclectic <sighs> things that most people will go i'm sorry what what now um i don't think i well i, I have I have one thing that people would go, what now? But we're not going to talk about them right now because they're still in quarantine. Uh -huh. And until I actually have what I know to be an established population, I don't want to talk a whole lot about them because I don't want everybody and their brother being like, awesome, gimme. You know, <laughs> right now, I have to get them through quarantine. And right. quite frankly, wild caught animals, when you bring them in and you're trying to establish a captive population, it's not a cakewalk. Nope. Um, it, it can be very difficult. It can be very heartbreaking at times. So we'll, we'll leave that one species off to the side, but everything else. So um, I have about half of my collection is ball pythons. Okay. And that's just, I don't want to say it's the mindless part of my hobby, but to an extent it is. Um, yeah. I work with the ball pythons because, you know, again, by education, by profession, I am a geneticist. It's it's a way I can bring my work home with me without actually bringing my work home with me. Yeah, um, I get I, it. Did you ever see the movie A Beautiful Mind? Yes. Yep. Okay. You know how, like, in that movie, when it shows him thinking, you see all the, like, equations and stuff that float around his head? Now, my mother, when she watched that movie, she's like, this movie is all about you. And at the time I was horribly offended because I thought my mother was saying she thought I was a schizophrenic mess. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I, I came to realize that my mother just, she knows that I, I view the world through my science, the way yes. that character viewed the world through his science. So when I look at animals, you know, yes, I see the animal, but I also see all the genes that go forth into the animal. And that, that includes, you know, even wild type animals and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the ball pythons, I get a kick out of the genetics and I get to play with the genetics and I get to be Frankenstein and exactly. make, you know, make all kinds of abominations. And that's, that's the fun end. And that, that helps keep me a little bit more even keeled yeah. for the other species that I'm working with, which are not nearly as straightforward. Um, yep. You know, rubber boas are, I don't want to say that they're difficult, but they're not. I mean, quite frankly, on the one hand, I think they, they would be a great animal for just about anybody because 
more than half of their care is just stupid easy. It's yeah. a room temperature cage. You know, that bottom cage right there, that's their cage. It's got an LED light bar in it, and that's it. No heat, no nothing. They thrive in that kind of cage. Exactly. When they're active. <clears throat> there it is. But, yeah. When you brumate them, okay, these guys are native to, you know, Pacific Northwest areas, it gets cold. It gets real cold. Yep. And these animals are evolved to handle that cold. Now, I'm not saying you want to just shovel snow on top of them, <laughs> but at the same time, if you go on Google and you look up habitat pictures of ball pi of rubber boas, you will find pictures of them crawling around in the snow that True. field herpers have found. You know, these animals they deal really well with cold and they also in captivity, they do need to be brumated and brumated cold. So right now mine are in a uninsulated storage closet, which I mean, it's not even a storage closet. It's, it's the access to my sump pump. No, oh, So it's, it's, it's underground. It's three walls of uninsulated concrete. It gets cold in there. Yep. Um, but they need that. They need that for long-term survival. Do you have to put them down and brumate them? No. Are they going to live long and productive lives if you don't? No. And that's why they're probably not as common in the hobby also because people don't like the idea of animals that don't kick off and start eating as soon as you get them out of the egg. You know, right. Baby rubber boas, it is not uncommon. You know, they're born at the end of summer. Okay, yeah. It is not uncommon for them as babies to go directly into brumation without eating. Oh man, that's crazy. Yeah. And it's hard for people to like wrap their head around the idea of just, you know, be comfortable of I'm going to take this baby and I am going to put it straight into brumation without feeding it. And it is going to be in brumation for four to six months. That's a long brumation too. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's so cold that their metabolism is basically non-existent at the time. Yep. And then come out of brumation, and that's when they start eating. You know, so people fight them and fight them and fight them to try to get those babies to eat. And, you know, you'll lose half of a clutch because you can't get them to eat. And then the ones that do eat, fine, they'll eat and they'll, you know, crank them out. But then they push them through a year. And so they're, they're difficult in that regard. And... It, it's always going to be a specialized species because of that. You know, I think some people will always want to try and pick them up as a novelty because all they think about is, hey, it's a room temperature animal. I can just do nothing with it. If you want a room temperature animal like that, go with an Asian rat snake. Yes. You don't, you don't have to basically put them in a chest freezer over the winter. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, you can keep those at room temperature and be fine with them like that. That's true. Um, other than the rubber boas, I have calabar boas. Um, that's a wild caught pair. Uh, the female is through quarantine. The male has got a little bit longer to go because I picked them up at separate times. Um, I figured since you know I had North American burrowing under the dirt, hardly ever gets seen boa constrictor. I should or boa species. I should get the African burrowing under the dirt, hardly ever see them at times. Boa species. Um, they are really cool in the respect that they are one of the very few boa species that actually lays eggs. Yes. And they are very large eggs. Yep. Um, I have a Dumeril's boa. That, okay. yep. that I inherited. Uh, my sister had to move her new place, wouldn't accept animals, so I got her Dumeril's. It's a fun little animal. Uh, incredibly insane feeding response. Yep. Um, Yep, that's them. Yeah, um, yeah. I love I love how cryptic she looks. You know, I've got her in with all kinds of leaves and stuff, and she will, you know, when she's in the mood, she'll just disappear out of the air, and you yep. don't even know she's there. And that's when you have to be really careful opening her cage because she will explode out of there. You know, if you want to know what it's like to keep a gaboon viper but not have to worry about getting killed by it, get a Dumeril's boa, and you know, yep, they'll sit there completely stationary, hidden in plain sight. And then you open the thing and they explode out like a, a mouse trap from hell, and you don't have to worry about being envenomated and dying. Um, 
I have a black-headed python. I have a pair of Brettles pythons. Awesome. I have two different species of beaked snakes, um, the Oxyrhynchus and the Rostratus. Oh, okay. Um, I have... What else do I have? I have the Kukri snakes. Oh, uh, yep. Those are fun. Those... A really cool species, not for people who want to hold their animals. They're very, very high strung, and they like to bite. Okay. Um, they're called kukris because they're named after the kukri dagger because yep. of the shape of their enlarged rear teeth. So they're not actually rear fanged, but they have these enlarged back teeth that they use to cut open eggs, exactly. which are a primary feed source. Um <laughs> And there was recently a paper that came out um, talking about this novel behavior that I, I hated saying it every time somebody posted the paper of, look at this new thing that we found when there are documented cases going back over a decade of these yeah. animals doing this. They will cut into a prey item. In this case, in the case of the paper, it was toads. They cut into the toad through its belly, and they eat all of its internal organs. Interesting rather than trying to eat the whole toad. And, you know, specifically they were looking at cane toads. And as as we all know from the cane toad invasion of Australia, cane toads are horribly toxic, so nothing yes. can eat them. Well, they're only horribly toxic on the outside with those giant pineal glands that pump out venom, poison. So if you cut into their side and go in and eat all of their guts out and just leave this hollowed out shell of a toad, Exactly. You can eat something that's really poisonous and not be poisoned. Yep. So it's really cool to see that. Um, like I said, there are documented cases going back in the hobby over a decade of the animals doing that same behavior. Um, you know, keepers would give them a mouse or something and the mouse was too big. So then the snake would just cut into the side of the mouse yeah. and eat the organs out of the mouse and leave the little hollowed out mouse carcass behind. So it's it's a really awesome behavior that they have, but defensively they will bite and they do they do a corkscrew motion once they bite. Oh, okay. So they instead of just biting and hanging on, they bite and they twist and they just basically turn your finger into a zoodle, which is not pretty. And right. their <laughs> their saliva seems to have an anticoagulant in it, so you get cut up, you get bled, and then you just bleed a lot. Now, so. don't do, don't most snakes have a have an anticoagulating um, agent to their saliva? There are a lot of snakes that have been looked at do seem to have some type of anticoagulant type. Um, it's the extent of how prevalent it is, and what right. proportion of it it makes up in the saliva, and they and, have a much higher yeah, and they they have they they seem to have a much like you know i barely got tagged by one and i was wearing gloves and it caught me through the glove and you know like if you have snakes you're going to get bitten by sometimes you know yeah. and you know i've taken a bite from my ball python and you know you jerk back you squeeze it out a little bit to you know express it then you wipe it off with a paper towel and, and that's it. That's done. And then, you know, and then later in the day, it looks like you just had a little finger prick test done at the doctor's office. Yep. Um, the little nick that I got from the kukri, like I said, through a glove, it was a gardening glove. So one of those knit ones with the latex and it managed to get right behind the latex on the, the knit stuff, went right through that into my knuckle. My knuckle was still bleeding three hours later. Oh, geez. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Um, all so, right. Well, <laughs> there, <laughs> the amount of anticoagulant in some snakes is definitely more aggressive than others. Yeah. Um, have you ever noticed any of that um, feeding behavior before of like the larger prey items or even eggs? Have you ever um, gotten to do it? Not with other prey items because I, I feed them smaller things intentionally. I'm, yeah. I'm. I am a very firm believer that we overfeed our animals in the hobby. So yeah. I tend to feed smaller prey items, and I also tend to feed less frequently than most people would. Um, right now, because of the time of year, my cookeries are getting one meal a month. There you go. And, you know, 
and people, you know, I, I hear people who freak out of that. And I'm like, I mean, my snakes have got great body condition. They look good. So I'm not, I'm not worried about it. You know, if they start looking really skinny or looking poorly, you know, I'll bump up, you know, an extra prey item or something in there on them, but I'm not just going to feed the ever loving hell out of my animals for the sake that they predators. They eat whenever they can because they in the wild they never really know when the next meal is coming yep and that programming is in them you know they're not truly domesticated animals as much as some people would like to pretend that they are um it you know that that mentality is there so i mean i i have snakes i know my blackhead i could literally put a medium rat in her cage every single day and she would eat a medium rat every single day. Yep. I don't do that, but I know that she would. Um, so yeah, I don't. I haven't seen it with larger prey items. I have seen it with eggs. Um, one of my first kukris, I got a trio of wild cots, and two of them took off just fine on quail eggs. But one of them refused to eat for me for quite some time, and I had a ball python clutch drop, and one of the eggs was a a dud mm -hmm. and you know since it's just a little slug yep i just took that and i stuck it in the cage and i came back an hour later and nice big half crescent moon oh. carved into it and i mean the snake was positively bloated from eating all of it but oh, man. you know she hadn't she hadn't eaten in a month and a half since i had gotten her right so, you know, you know, that's what the, that's what they'll do in the wild though. They will glut when they find one and then, you know, cause they never know when they're going to get their next meal. You know, yep. now I did not immediately then take more ball python eggs and throw them into her. I, you know, once she did that, I, you know, I let her digest. And you know, then about three weeks later, I stuck a quail leg in there and she went right after the quail leg. So nice. she just needed something to kickstart her. Um, that's awesome. So, uh, so you brought it up a little bit ago. How, how's your uh, how's your blackhead? Would you say that she's a, a nice, calm animal, or? Um, <laughs> I mean, yes and no. <laughs> she, so blackheads have a reputation of being very food oriented. She absolutely is that. Mm -hmm. um, they also a lot of them have a. So I picked I picked my girl up from Derek Roddy, and okay. you know, Derek's a very big name in the blackhead industry. Yep. And Derek, I think the best description I ever heard Derek say is, "It's like a biting piece of duct tape. Yes, Once they yes. get onto you, then they just wrap up on, and stick all on top of you, and you know, that's that's absolutely how they are. Yep. Um, but some of them are more prone to bite first and think later." Mm -hmm. And some of them aren't. So you can kind of think of it a bit like a California king snake. If anybody has kept those, there's a very, very obvious tell that that snake is about to bite you. You know, you'll be holding it, it'll be fine. And then all of a sudden, it'll take its head and just like point down and start new pushing its nose against you. Nope. And if you don't act immediately, you're about to get bit by your cow king. Yes. Okay. And it's one thing when you're dealing with a three to four foot cow king and have that happen. You know, it's yep. an uncomfortable sensation. It's another thing when you're dealing with a six to eight foot blackhead that does that. Um, now, I'm really lucky. My girl has never shown that behavior, but I know that it's there. Yes. Um, so I'm always on watch for it. And there was one time, you know, She's very personable, you know, she, they're extremely aware animals, you know, mm -hmm. I go into the room and she, you know, she pops out from behind her hide or under her log and comes up to the corner and starts watching me. And sometimes if I'm just cleaning tubs and things, I'll open the cage and I'll, she'll stick her head out and she'll look around and maybe she'll just hang out with her head out and watch me. But she never just comes all the way out. She just likes to see what's going on. Right. One day I had the cage open like that and I went down under her to get into the Brettles cage and I had my hand just sitting on the track next to her head mm -hmm. and I felt her head brush me and I looked up and it, it was that 
you know, that oh, losing wow. behavior, but I knew what it was. And, you know, that was on me. I should not have had my hand in her cage like that. Plus I had a box of rats in the room cause it was feeding day. So right. she was keyed on smell and then something warm sitting next to her head. And I saw it happening as it was happening. You know, I went to pull my head, my hand back, her head came up with that mouth open and the only thing I could think to do was take me out of, I had to pin her head between my hands to keep her from biting me. But as soon as I did that, she wrapped me and she wrapped my arms together like this. Nice. <laughs> so I'm in this, you know, I'm sitting here looking like I'm praying with an eight foot black head wrapped around my arms. That's awesome. And, you know, I could let go of her head because if I did, she would bite me. Now I wasn't crushing her head, but I just had her restrained. So I had to then go over and open my phone and type in to my daughter, I need your help. And my daughter came down and had to unwind her from my arms That's while I is. kept control of her head. So, you know, it'll, it'll get your blood rushing. Um, but every other time that I've handled her, she's been, huh. she's a baby doll. You know, I don't just reach straight into her right. cage. You know, I use a hook, but I think people need to use hooks for just about everything because it's smarter and safer for you and the animal. You know, if you startle that animal, it turns around and bites you. Yes. If you startle the animal with a hook and it turns around and realizes that it's a hook and then calms down with, oh, okay, this is what's going on, it's easier for you and the animal. Um, right. You know, but I've, I've taken that girl out to, you know, to schools, uh, to the local children's museum. I don't let kids hold her, no, but, but I'm, I'm still comfortable, you know, having her up on my shoulders and having the back half of that animal down where kids can pet her, you know, her tail and her back mm -hmm. and have her hand her head up in my hand and not worry that when the kid touches her, she's going to freak and try and bite me. Right. That's really cool. I just, I had to ask because I, whenever I hear that someone has a blackhead, I've heard they're, they almost seem to be a lot more individualistic with their behavior than a lot of other snakes that I've either kept or, or done research on. Like mine makes a weird vocalization when she is upset. It's like a high pitched squealing hiss. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, She's not quick to bite, but she's very defensive. And once out the behavior that you that you talked about, fine. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as that nudging, that. But and then I've heard um, other ones where they will just they they will Cali King fly out of the cage, hit the ground, chase you as well. So I'm yeah, just always... I mean, it, the the food response is insane. Yeah. Um, I have I have a couple of pictures from a few years ago, I opened the tub mm -hmm. and I, I had fed everything else in the room. So she had, she had smelled this one. She was still small enough to fit in a tub, right? She had been smelling rats the whole time. And I opened the, and I opened the tub with my hand and yeah, it was exactly like, it's just this. And I, I pulled back and you know, you've got, she's dangling half out of the tub, just yeah. flapping around with her mouth open. And then to try and get the rat in front of her mouth. Cause she's just so keyed that, you yeah. know, and when she finally did get the rat, she, and I still don't understand how she did this. She threw like her whole body. She wrapped the rat and then managed to get a coil around my arm and wrap the rat against my arm. <laughs> so I had to wait for her <laughs> to, you know, subdue this frozen thawed rat yep. and decide that it was dead and then release my arm. But every time I tried to relax, you know, to just try and relax my hand, because the forceps were getting torqued against me. Every time I tried to relax my hand, she'd feel the muscles in my arm move yep. and think that it was the rat struggling. So she would tighten down even more. Yeah. And I took a picture of myself, you know, all contorted with a rat and a snake Right. Wrapped around my arm. That's hilarious. They're fun. They're Ast great animals. Ast um, are, are not hilarious. for everybody, but oh, good yeah. animals. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just had to ask because it always, they're, it's always fun stories about, like unless they, unless they're producing blackheads, in which case you always hear they're great. But if you just have like one or a pair, you always hear really fun stories. So I just had to ask. No, I mean Derek has got so many great stories. Um, you know, he, he had one, I don't know if he still has it, but like, basically he had to keep an extra pair of shoes <laughs> because every time he opened the cage to clean the cage, the snake would come out and attack his shoes. That's hilarious. 
So then he just, he would open the cage and the snake would come and he had the extra pair of shoes there. And, you know, the snake would take his shoe and then he'd take the shoe off and put on his, his other shoe and so just, that he could continue to go. And, it, you know, and, you know, half an hour later, the snake spits the, you know, let's go with the shoe and let's it out of his coils. And he puts the snake back in the cage. Oh my God. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. So there you go. See, snakes are fun. Not everybody. Uh, yeah. <laughs> snakes are great. <laughs> They're honored. That's hilarious. They're not for everybody, but that's okay. No, no. And even then there's, you know, snake species for, for different people. And I mean, I know, like, I think the ball python for me, just kind of like you, although clearly not quite to the extent because my brain does not go that far. That's why I really like ball pythons is the genetics. And, you know, as you said, playing Frankenstein, but you know, just different colubrids. Like I've been head over heels with Pituophis this last year because they're just such a different animal than really any other python species and really a lot of other colubrid species too they're just yeah a little different I mean, there's there's something for everybody it's yep. it's figuring out what that something is and it's mm-hmm. also making sure you can care for that animal yes. properly um you know and i speak from my own years of you know I've, a, a lot of it's behind me, but you know, I've had the impulse buys. I've had the, ooh, wow, pick it up and then come home and then be like, I have no idea how to keep this animal, how to set this animal up. You know, yep. th- those years are way, way far behind me. But you know, there are still times. You know, I've, I've, the, you know, when I got the beaked snakes, yeah. I went down to pick up. I, it was when I went down to pick up my kukris, and the guy, he, you know, the beak snakes came in with them, and these were they were babies that had been captive hatched. So right. you know, they, they caught an animal, it dropped eggs, the eggs were incubated, they, they hatched out and they shipped the babies over. And I literally knew nothing about them, but I was like, these are awesome and I want them. And I picked them up, but you know, this is decades into my keeping career. I knew where they came from. So in the short term of setting them up in a proper quarantine setup, Yep. I knew I knew the range that I had and you know what I needed to do for them during quarantine. And in that quarantine time, I dove hard into natural history, you know, diet, evolution, things like that to make sure that when they came out of quarantine, I would be setting them up fully and properly for what they needed. You know, right. I don't advocate that a lot of people do that. You know, again, like I said, I'm decades into my career as being a keeper. So I have a bit more comfort with that, but right. you know, with other things, I think about it before I go out and buy it. You know, if I decide that I want to work with something new, I don't pull the trigger first and then do my research later. I do my research first and then I pull the trigger. Right. Um, you know, I've been looking at Calabars for a couple of years, and I did all of my research on the front end, and then when Calabars came in, that's when I picked them up. Um, you know, the closest I got to breaking that rule would be, again, this new species that I brought in, which, you know, I, I talked to a bunch of guys. They know I like weird things. And one of them dropped me a line. He's like, look, we just got these in. I think they'd be right up your alley. And I was like, okay, well, what are they? And he sent me the scientific name. And I said, well, I'll let you know. Okay. And then I went and did research. But, you know, I did a whole bunch of research only to find there's not a lot out there. So... I'm kind of blazing new ground, which goes back to that's why I don't want to talk too much about what they are and get everybody out there all psyched that, you know, Travis has something new and awesome. You know, I, don't, I think they're new. I, well, I know they're new. I think they're awesome. I don't care if anybody else thinks they're awesome. Right. My goal is not to be, you know, the guy that finds the next awesome thing for the hobby. I'm keeping them for myself. If other people like them, awesome. Great. You know, if I can produce some and get a nice stable captive population in for those other people that like them, cool. I will like that. Yeah. But I'm not I'm also not gonna be charging you three thousand dollars an animal because I think that's just stupid. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, there's there's a lot of weird 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 ways this hobby's kind of gone in a direction that I know is a lot different than how it used to be probably when uh, you very first got into it. And I think ball pythons are a big part of that and morphs in general. 
but yeah, they are. And you know, it's the ball pythons are both the bane of the hobby and part of the reason that we have the hobby. I mean, I've been saying that from the beginning. I did a whole video about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's they're great. Yep. They're they're eye catching. They're really easy. They, you know, they're simple. They get people intrigued. Exactly. Um, you know, but the downside is they are tough as hell so that they can take a lot of abuse. And yeah. so you end up getting a lot of them that are just impulse bought because they're cool. Yeah. They're kept for a long while improperly and then end up dying. But they still end up getting people, you know, either into the hobby or in enough. And that's the problem. They get them in enough that then they start picking up more and more and more animals only to find out that they're treating all other animals improperly. Right. Um, you know, but like we wouldn't have rack systems. We wouldn't have heat tape. We wouldn't have all of these things if it wasn't for all pythons. Yep. You yeah. know, nothing else really caught the public the way the ball python did. You know, corn snakes came close, but corn snakes had their downsides because as babies, they're yeah. real difficult. Yeah. for people to be able to deal with you know it's hard for a kid to get interested in something that's so small that they can't they can't really handle it's like, when exactly. you know that's what the kid wants we all want to you know we all want to have the snake in our house because we saw the snake outside and we wanted to catch it but we couldn't or we shouldn't now we have the snake in our house and we know it's safe to pick up and hold but when you're trying to deal with a little scoring piece of spaghetti noodle yep that's that's not the best you know i think if if it were possible to sell corn snakes as yearlings or older exactly it would be great but nobody's going to hold on to their corn snakes for a year before they sell them. yep that's you know, a, a year old corn snake is an ideal pet it's big enough to be able to pick up it's not crazy squirmy it's eating well at that point in time yep it's good yep. um yeah i always tell people the ball pythons the snake yeah You're the ball good. pythons you know, they're great for beginners because they're pretty and they're easy. But at the same time, you know, they go off food. People freak out. They don't understand. That's you true. know, they they get stressed out sometimes if you put them in this giant thing. And you know, people put them in giant barren enclosures and then don't understand. You know, you you can put it in a big cage, but it's got to be a big cage with a lot of places to hide, a lot of places to feel secure because the animal needs to feel secure. You know. A corn snake will be out wandering around in the open. It doesn't need as, you know, it just needs one hide and it'll be happy. Yep. And because I, it's got one place to hang out and it doesn't care. And the rest of the time it'll crawl around. I think we're starting to see a bit of a shift to that. I think because like the big guys out there have had such a almost like revolt against them with the rack systems and big breeding, which is an entire other type of keeping that. 99% of us shouldn't even try to get into um, that we're starting to see. I, I see it a whole lot more because I probably frequent like the forums and Facebook groups probably more than you do. And sometimes I hate myself for doing that. Um, <laughs> but I am starting to see a bit of a shift where I see people now starting to say, hey, here's my setup. It's still in an aquarium, but I see I see a towel over some of it. I see it taped up. I see I don't see a red light anymore. And I'm seeing a very like a, a, a heavy layer of a thick layer of substrate and a lot of stuff in there. And then they're just talking about like just the idiosyncrasies of this dumb pet rock that just sometimes says, I'm not going to eat for eight months, even though you're doing everything right. Yeah. So but then, in part of that's normal sometimes. Yeah. And so I think there's starting to be a shift towards kind of that better keeping where it's we're starting to see, yeah, racks. <laughs> I'm not going to get into the racks versus cage thing because that's a whole, that's a whole topic. It's a, that I really, it's a big topic, and you know, the, the right answer is you keep the way that's right for you, which is correct. That that's if correct. I had, yeah. if I only had five ball pythons, they would be in cages. I mean, you can see I've got, I've got three cages behind me here. Yep. You know, rubber boa, gray band, gray band. In that's my it. snake room, I have a wall that's all cages. My brettles, my blackhead, my beak snakes, my calabars, the dumerals. Yep. You know, all of those are in cages. But I have 50 ball pythons. Exactly. I do not have room for 50 ball python cages. And that's, yeah. Ball pythons 
Is it ideal for them to be in Iraq? No. Do they do well in Iraq? Do they, I don't want to say thrive, but do, are, they, are they suffering from being in Iraq? No. Ideally, would it be great if I had the room to put all 50 of them in individual cages? Yes. Yep. But I can't, you know, could I cut down on the number of ball pythons so that I could keep all of the ball pythons that I have in cages? Maybe. But... Maybe. I mean, it depends on, you know, I have a bunch of different projects that I'm working on and a bunch of different animals that I'm growing up to work on those projects. Yes. If I cut out half of my projects and had half as many ball pythons, maybe. Could I fit 25 cages in there? Possibly. But at that point, 25 cages are going to take up about the same space as the rack systems and not provide much more space than the racks provide, you know, because you've got to deal with the extra, you know, height and shifting and mm. air ventilation and everything to be able to get all in. So as a net outcome, it's, it's not terrible, but, you know, Am I a horrible person because I keep my ball pythons in racks? Right. No. Yeah. Do I think that people who use racks to keep their ball pythons, their corn snakes, their king snakes, their pitchuopus, their whatever in racks are terrible people? No. Unless you're doing it completely inappropriately, like if you're trying to fit a 10-foot berm in a Christmas tree sweater box. Yes. You know, that, there's no go on that. Like, you know, my, my blackhead. When she was only four and a half feet long, having her in a, you know, in a sweater system, you know, that worked. Yep. It wasn't ideal. And that was only because I put her in there initially because I had ordered a rack or a, a cage yep. that was bigger. And that cage took a significant amount of time to get to me. I had not anticipated that it would take as long as it took. In fact, I finally went out at a show and bought another cage because it had just taken so long. Yep. Um, and as soon as I had that cage, I put her in that larger cage. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's, I think, I think we're starting to see a shift behind that. Although, yeah, I mean, there's, there's always going to be a need for rack systems with ball pythons because ball pythons aren't going away. Maybe no. the market might die down a bit, but like you said, they're great. Do you know how many people I get interested in snakes because I bring out a highway or a bell ball python because it doesn't even look real? And then yeah, that, that's it's, smart. It's, but that's why I've loved albino. I've always loved albinos. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I bought it. I bought that little fourteen years old. I bought that little red and white corn snake, but, and uh, you know I've been an albino freak ever since then because albinos just they catch the eye. Right. You no, know, you can. I, I could take out any snake at a show for kids, and the one that they're going to remember is that that yellow and white one. Yep. And that's that's what I always tell people. I went. I want to be. What, so what do you want to do, Jay Z? And I say, well, I want to be that guy who shows up at your at your school cafeteria with a big yellow snake. That's what I want to be because everyone remembers that from all walks of life. That's why I tell people all the time because that's what they remember. And you're right. That's they go. Oh, right. Yeah, at the library. He had that big. Yeah, the yellow one. So, but any who's will be. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually, we've been actually going for for a little while, despite our, our, our <laughs> despite our little hiccup at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Yay! It's all good. Yeah, they didn't. Uh, that that's the one thing I end up saying a lot more than anything else these days is when I when I first first got into snakes and they started to say yeah you can do this and you can breed them and this and that they didn't tell me that I was going to have to learn to be an electrician a plumber a carpenter I'm going to have to learn HVAC and and figuring out like whole room and ambient temperatures and all this other stuff and then yeah, and realize you that cages and you have to become an interior decorator for everything that you're putting inside of the cages and yeah yep. exactly <laughs> And it's then, enough to make you crazy. I know. And then I have and then I have real ball python breeders that give me a hard time because I have four foot long tubs that are still a rack system. That's where my big female ball pythons are in. They're in four foot long tubs. Mm -hmm. So even then, that's I can fit almost two of a V70 or whatever. I think yeah, the V70s. Yeah. One of those for one. But you know, then 
if everyone does that, the cost of the snakes go up, and then it makes it harder to get to break into. So, you know, leeway, give and take. Yeah, it's it's like you said, there is a shift happening. I like that the shift is happening. Yep. But again, as with everything, there's also a problem with it because you get the the people who think that all racks suck and there's never a reason to use a rack and they will come down and be like a ton of lead if they find out that you yep. use a rack and then you get the, the hardcore rack advocates who refuse to believe that a ball python can be kept in anything other than a rack and everybody's going at each other's throats and yep. you know it's do what's right for you yep. and let other people do what's right for them if you don't like racks and you want to keep in a cage great keep in a cage, yeah, if exactly. you don't like a cage and you want to keep in a rack great the animal don't is, don't drag on me because I keep in a, a rack. I won't drag on you because you keep in a cage. Exactly. Don't hate me because I like spider ball pythons. Don't hate somebody who doesn't like spider ball pythons. Yep. It's it's what it is. That's true. Yeah. Just you know, if the animals, if it's eating, if it's shedding, it's it's defecating, you know, it's it's doing what it's supposed to do, then you do the best for you, like you said. So. And you know, be happy for me that I'm enjoying my animals. I'll be happy for you that you're enjoying your animals. And that's that's what needs to happen in the hobby more is, you know. We all love animals. It's right. We all love animals. We all love these, you know. Don't don't get down on people for doing things differently than you. Because yeah, exactly. ultimately we all liked we we all like the animals and that's the way it should be. Yep. Well, I think that's a pretty good pretty good place to wrap this up, Gwen. Uh, huh? Thank you so much. Um, are you okay if people reach out to you or? Yeah, um, you can find me on Facebook, Travis Wyman. The caveat that I add there for everybody is there is another Travis Wyman. He is a motocross racer. Do not message him. I'm <laughs> sure that he does not care about your snakes. I don't know this specifically because I've never messaged him, but just know that there are multiple Travis Wymans out there. The other one is a famous motocross racer. That's not me. Yep. Um you can find me on Instagram. I am snakes underscore n underscore bakes. Um, you can reach out to me there if you like. And you can email me ASPLUNDII at gmail. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this was really great. I really appreciate you. Uh, there was a lot of coordination that happened on this one that was a bit of a pain. So thank you so much yeah. for putting up with me on that end. <laughs> Finding a, hey, I, I was pain too. I mean, Finding time sometimes is, it just goes right out the window. <laughs> so I appreciate you letting me get back to you when it worked for me. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much and hope everyone enjoyed this episode and hopefully we will uh, get back to you on the next episode. Thank you so much. Bye.